Okay, the topic of our event today is community and academic centers working together for best patient outcomes. This topic is one that I am really excited to have a discussion on today and has been in the works for several months. I've heard from many patients in our communities over the last year that they receive care in their community centers and are interested in how they could work with an academic center or that they want to get a referral from to an academic center that they're currently being seen by both and they're curious how that works. Uh, we know that having working relationships between academic and community centers uh, gives patients the best opportunity to receive the best care possible and it helps to break down some healthcare barriers. So today our panelists are going to discuss this topic. I'm gonna take a moment to introduce our two panelists. First, we have Dr. David Swoboda. He is the Director of Leukemia at Tampa General Hospital Cancer Institute and an Assistant Professor at the University of South Florida College of Medicine. Prior to joining TGH, Dr. Swoboda served as the Chief Hematology Oncology Fellow at Moffitt Cancer Center and Chief Resident at Georgetown University Hospital. He's actively involved in the care of patients with acute leukemias and myelodysplastic syndromes, in addition to serving as principal investigator on multiple clinical trials in these diseases. Dr. Saboda has been an active part of our MBS education since the very beginning, participating in our very first webinar and also our Health Tree University program and providing research updates during medical conferences. So I'm really excited to have him here today. During our last trip out to Tampa General, he and I had a conversation about today's webinar topic, and I knew he'd be a great one to have present here. Dr. Saboda then introduced me to our next panelist for today, Dr. Tony Curian. Dr. Curian is a hematologist oncologist at Florida Cancer Specialists. He completed internal medicine training at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago, where he served as chief resident and went on to train in hematology and oncology at Moffitt Cancer Center, where he served as chief fellow and completed additional training in blood and marrow transplant and cellular immunotherapy. He currently works as a community hematologist and medical oncologist, treating a broad range of conditions to meet the needs of the local community that he serves. I am so excited to have these two incredible physicians here with us today to help us address this topic. Normally, this is where we turn the presentation over to our speakers, but today is going to be a little different. This webinar is going to be more discussion-based, so we're going to work through some questions and let our two panelists really discuss this topic and share their thoughts before we get to all of your questions at the end during the Q&A. So now we're just gonna get in to the discussion. The overall goal and the main question we're trying to answer is how does collaboration between community and academic centers help patients receive the best care possible? That's a really big question. So we're gonna start with a little bit of context on each of you and your experiences with patient care. So Dr. Curian, can you give us a little bit of an overview of your role uh, um, in community centers and patient care and maybe some challenges you experience? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, thank you uh, for the kind introduction and, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate in this important discussion. Um, so <clears throat> again, I'm Dr. Tony Curian uh, and I and uh, as as was stated, I, I work in a large group practice, uh, Florida cancer specialists, uh, and I I serve the patients in Venice and Inglewood, Florida. Uh, so these are smaller communities um, south of Sarasota. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Chicago. I grew up in Tampa. I attended med school in Tampa, went to uh, residence in Chicago and came back to Tampa and trained at uh, Moffitt uh, with Dr. Swoboda. So we, we know each other well as well. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I just broadly, I think that the role of community clinics in the care of um, AML, MDS, and, and really all blood cancers, leukemias and lymphomas in general, um, I think it's a it's a really critical uh, role um, in in uh, in serving the community for uh, folks like myself and, and community practice to partner with uh, academic centers um, for optimal care delivery. Um, so I you know I think uh, we play an important role, really in the full spectrum of of the uh, disease journey. Um, in that, oftentimes patients come through you know uh, my clinic uh, with abnormal blood counts or symptoms. And so I think oftentimes a community oncologist such as myself play, play an important role in identifying and making a diagnosis, um, whether that's through imaging, bone marrow biopsies, additional advanced testing um, like NGS, um, and then you know through to management of uh, low-grade blood cancers that might just require monitoring and surveillance to supportive transfusions um, uh, and monitoring. Uh, to delivery of treatments, um, and then, of course, identification and referral. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, there's a 
storm warning uh, in Florida. So that's my phone going off. I apologize um, for that alert there. Uh, but uh, so, um, but yes, yeah, so importantly, identification and referral of the appropriate patients um, to academic centers uh, for, you know, induction treatments or specialized treatments uh, or transplantation or additional consultation by, um, by sub, uh, specialists, leukemia specialists, such as Dr. Swoboda or lymphoma specialists. Um, and then, you know, just day-to-day -day management of, you know, acute symptoms that might occur, infections, infection prevention, treatment-related side effects, um, and then, you know, all the way through to post, you know, uh, definitive treatment care uh, or post-transplant monitoring, long-term survivorship. So I think we in the community play a, a pretty key role uh, across the spectrum, you know, broadly for these diseases, and it's patient to patient. Um, you know, and I think that sort of revolves around, um, you know, certainly access is one important facet, right? Um, availability of like leukemia doctors, uh, such as Dr. Sploda and others is um, uh, li limited. So, well, not limited, I should say, uh, but, uh, you know, I think when, when these subspecialists are able to partner with folks like myself in the community, it allows folks like Dr. Swoboda to see more patients and make sure they're all getting the, the care that they need and their, their needs are met. Um, some may have issues with insurance coverage, depending on, uh, you know, what, what the requirements are for the local academic centers. Um, but also just purely like distance, you know, I, we're a few hours away from Tampa, which would be our closest, um, you know, academic center. Um, and that's not easy for, for most people. Um, and uh, oftentimes with these blood cancers, uh, the care needs may be very high. They may need very frequent visits. Um, and so it's a little easier to accommodate that when, when you can go somewhere around the corner. Um, and, uh, and certainly if you're traveling frequently, very far distances, there's certainly a lot of costs that might accrue with, with frequent visits, uh, you know, out of, out of town. Um, so, uh, so yes, I think there's a, it's a lot of a, a important role for collaboration. Um, and uh, as far as some challenges uh, with care delivery, um, you know, we, we're in, in these smaller uh, clinics, such as the ones I, I work in, um, certain things uh, require a little extra time and, and coordination. So even just doing a blood transfusion, uh, I have to coordinate with the local hospital. It might take a day or two sometimes. And so I, uh, I have to kind of make some practical decisions about when to make transfusions and things like that. Um, and uh, sometimes we will have to send folks to the ER depending on the situation. Uh, so, you know, so resources uh, in that sense. And, and then another, you know, important um, challenge sometimes can certainly be communication and coordination with our academic partners. So it's great when we have good working relationships, such as uh, myself and Dr. Swoboda and others. But you know, when we when we don't necessarily uh, know the other colleague as well, and you know, it, it's not necessarily always uh, simple to coordinate um, between institutions. But but that also you know highlights the importance of making sure we're um, networking well and and uh, have a, having a good uh, good lines of communication and 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 uh, ability to collaborate. So those are some broad uh, thoughts on, on the topic. Thank you for providing that context and kind of highlighting what, you know, your role is in patient care. Dr. Sabota, same questions to you, your role in an academic center in patient care and some challenges that you experience. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mary, uh, for the invitation uh, to speak at this event. Yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm going to echo a lot of the same points that Dr. Curry made from, you know, my side. Um, you know, I'm an academic physician. You know, I, I focus on a, a small subset of diseases, mostly MBS, AML, and myeloproliferative neoplasms. Um, and I run the leukemia program, uh, which has a large inpatient service in addition to the, um, you know, care that we can provide in the outpatient setting. And what I would say is that, you know, we, you know, we can't, provide the best care possible without our community partners. Uh, it's, it's, the rea it's the reality um, because, you know, I take care of patients from across the, uh, in the entire state of Florida and sometimes even beyond that. And without, um, you know, local care, uh, the challenges and lo uh, logistically for patients would just be way, um, way too much. And so, you know, I think all patients should have 
you know, both the community and, and an academic provider in, in their care, uh, with the academic provider primarily serving for, um, you know, to be that specialist, to, uh, you know, on very rare or very uh, challenging cases um, that, you know, just aren't, you know, seen at a high enough volume in, in, in a community setting. And so, again, you know, I focused on a couple diseases. That's all I see in my clinic all day, every day. And so, so be, um, you know, I do research, um, I do clinical trials. And so you become very comfortable and very specialized and really being able to understand the, the subtleties of each individual patient, each individual situation um, within the disease. Um, and, you know, with how much cancer care is changing, especially um, with the way we think about um, how mo um, molecular mutations or somatic mutations affect cancer, you know, it really does become very complex in not only the, the diagnostic side of things, but um, prognosis and treatment recommendations. And so to be able to understand and provide that um, insight, but then to, you know, work with the community provider to deliver the actual care at home for anything that's standard of care, um, it really is, is what's best practice for um, you know, our, our patients that we take care of. But it's not always sort of, um, it's not always a uh, one, uh, one size fits all for patients. You know, some of my patients might spend, you know, 10, 10 or less percent of their time, you know, with me and the majority of the time with the community provider. You know, I might see them once every three months or every six months. And, and, that's, and that's right for them. And that's right for the setting that they're in. Some patients spend 80 to 90 percent of the time in our clinic um, and then we'll get, you know, certain things within the community clinic. And so it really um, is just an ongoing discussion and ongoing collaboration um, and, and very specific to an individual's patient's case. Um, when we talk about challenges, you know, like Dr. Curian said, you know, in, in academics, um, you know, we, we do, you know, want to see as many patients as we can possible and touch as many cases as possible um, across uh, the state of Florida or beyond. And, and so ultimately, you know, in order to do that, um, we are, you know, somewhat space limited in what we can actually um, do regarding chemotherapy, transfusions in our main site. And so having all these collaborators is the way that we're able to, um, you know, provide best care to patients uh, at, at a higher rate and a higher volume. Um, and so, you know, other challenges uh, within a, an academic practice, you know, sometimes uh, community practices can be more, you know, actually more efficient. So they can get, uh, you know, have larger infusion centers, deliver, you know, uh, chemotherapy uh, quicker for patients, um, and, you know, get, you know, certain testing quicker uh, because they don't have to deal with, you know, a larger volume or, you know, certain things uh, that, that we have to deal with at a, at a larger academic center. Um, so I, I would say, you know, that that's um, some of the benefits and the challenges, you know, I think uh, to echo Tony, uh, Dr. Curian, uh, communication is really key in making sure the, the relationship is the most successful for our patients. Thank you also for providing that context and kind of sharing a little bit about the academic side. I want to kind of get into the decision making that goes into patient care. So patients are making a lot of decisions about their care, especially early on. What kinds of factors, uh, both medical and you know situational, play a role in informing where a patient should receive care and who they should have on their on their medical team? Yeah, you know, I, I can I can start by taking this. So, you know, I, I think um, it really depends on a little bit of the rarity of the disease because, um, you know, that um, provides, you know, less or more comfort level in their community provider. Um, clinical trials, you know, I think if it's a disease type that really needs access to a clinical trial, you know, there is, you know, Dr. Curran's practice is, is very large. They do have access to a lot of clinical trials, but they tend to have access to clinical trials for things that are less inpatient focused. Um, you know, and more uh, community driven. And so, you know, we, you know, at a larger academic centers that tend to have, you know, more, you know, rare clinical trials, more inpatient focused clinical trials for patients, you know, that have acute leukemias that spend a lot of time in the hospital. And so that's sort of the, the difference um, in, in the, the, the different settings there. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kareem uh, to comment as well. Yes, I would... Uh echo basically all of those sentiments as well. Um, I think that 
I think this really becomes a very individualized decision uh, specific to the patient, their their particular circumstance medically, um, and then more broadly, uh, their life circumstances as well. So there's a lot of factors that play a role. Uh, when we're talking about blood cancer, I mean, oftentimes, for most diagnoses, I do bring up, uh, you know, seeing a, a specialist, getting a second opinion. I think that I think it's fair to say that really any cancer diagnosis is uh, is serious, and it's really important that the patients uh, feel comfortable with the plan of care, um, and they feel confident that uh, and comfortable with the care that they're getting. Um, there are certain situations where the treatment plan may be, um, you know, fairly, fairly, I guess, straightforward as far as what should be done. And, and we may have very readily uh, have access to uh, what treatment might be necessary and diagnostic testing might be necessary. But there are all sorts of circumstances where, you know, we're either dealing with something that is a rare diagnosis or we're dealing with something that might be a common diagnosis, but there's a really nuanced situation that's occurring. Um, and so, you know, uh, I, I, there are circumstances where medically I feel very strongly that uh, pa my patient would benefit from seeing uh, someone at an academic center, depending on the diagnosis and depending on the circumstance. And in those situations, that's what I explain to the patient. And then there are, there are other situations where, um, you know, uh, I may not feel as strongly that that might be needed. That's not going to be the case in some of the diagnoses we're talking about here. But regardless, um, even if that's the case, the patient may just feel more comfortable having had a second opinion and feeling like, hey, we, we got two sets of eyes looking at the situation and, and we're all in agreement about what the plan is moving forward. And in that situation, that's the right thing to do for that patient. But there are numerous uh, you know factors that play a role for any particular patient. So I think uh, considering um, you know how that patient and their family is feeling about the diagnosis and the treatment plan, and then also partnering with the doctor you're, you're working with to, to figure out if if it may be of value to to kind of get a an additional opinion from a, someone at an academic center or a second opinion, um, so so it's sort of specific to the situation, I would say. Yeah, and I and I agree, and I'll comment on that a little bit more, you know, because within you know uh, heme malignancies, uh, which you know is sort of the focus of this uh, you know community event, you know, there is a lot of new therapies, you know, so we have you know bispecific T cell engagers, which is one type of new therapy. Um, we have CARG T cells, which is genetically engineered uh, T cells, another type of therapy that at this time really, for the most part, aren't able to be delivered in the community setting, although that's changing as uh, these newer therapies become more readily available and more uh, providers are becoming more comfortable uh, with them. But currently, um, to get access to some of these you know, new, new therapies that are not you know, uh, any longer you know, uh, on clinical trial, you will have to partner uh, with an academic institution. Uh, but, you know, in the long term and in something that we're working with, you know, with a lot of different practices, including Florida Cancer Specialists, is, you know, how best to par partner on, on these things as well. So is there an opportunity to, you know, do, um, you know, certain things, uh, you know, a transplant being one of them as well um, at, you know, this main academic site, and then pretty quickly transition them back to the, the community to get the rest of their care. Because uh, most patients want to spend the least amount of time, uh, you know, obviously away from their families, away from their home. Um, and, and that's uh, even, you know, as an academic provider, that's, that's my goal is anything that we can do closer to home, you know, we, we, we definitely try to do and anything that I can do to pay, make patients life and their quality of life better, whether it's through, you know, telehealth visits, you know, more, you know, more labs and, uh, you know, locally, um, anything that we can possibly do, we, we try to do in our clinic. I'd love to hear some examples. Um, you mentioned that you guys work together. Um, your centers work together. I'd love to hear some examples of how you, either of you have partnered with people at, you know, if you're at that, if you're Dr. Sabota at the community or Dr. Korean at the academic level, I'd love to hear some examples. Yeah, so um, so I'll give you an example. So like, of just like how how the the life cycle of a patient could potentially be. 
Um, so, you know, let's say a patient shows up in Dr. Kareem's clinic uh, with low blood count. Um, you know, he would evaluate the patient you know, potentially do a bone marrow biopsy. And let's say that bone marrow biopsy comes back that the patient has a acute leukemia. He would then send a referral, um, you know, potentially call me and say, you know, uh, we'd like to refer this patient up. Uh, you know, what do you think? Um, and, you know, we would quickly evaluate this patient in my clinic. And ultimately, most of the time, we would bring them into the hospital to deliver chemotherapy inpatient for um, most, of the, most types of acute leukemia. Um, they would spend, you know, anywhere between two weeks to four weeks in the hospital um, being managed by our, you know, team of specialists that focuses on blood cancers and really focuses on inpatient blood cancers um, and a group of uh, nurse practitioners and PAs and, and pharmacists that are really all focused on just that. Um, we would get the patient through that therapy. Um, they would be safe to leave the hospital. And then, you know, we have what's called a transitional care coordinator that would then reach out to Dr. Kurian and Dr. Kurian's office um, and make sure that we have the patient scheduled for a lab visit, follow-up visit in the office locally. Uh, they would be discharged. They would follow up and get their labs and things that they would need there. I would stay involved in that patient's case, um, you know, whether it's through telehealth visits or in-person visits, depending on what's needed. Um, and, and then, you know, if we need to bring the patient back to Tampa for certain therapies, we can definitely do that. Or if we're able to manage things locally, we would do that with just, um, you know, kind of the expert insight. Um, and, 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 that, and that's how it would sort of go. And, and so this is something that we do, you know, we, you know, we, we, you know every, every other week, you know, we're, you know, having uh, similar situations, you know, across, you know, doctors, you know, we're doing this every day or you know, multiple times a day where, um, you know, we're getting these types of referrals, managing things and getting them back to, you know, their local provider. Um, so that's sort of the life cycle of an acute leukemia patient. Um, you know, Dr. Curran can uh, you know, talk about his experiences from, from his end. Yes, um, I'll share a couple uh, examples of some patients we have in common. And, and I think it, there's you know, this can look very different from patient to patient. So, you know, on, on, on the higher acuity end, um, you know, I, I might, I have a patient that is uh, admitted at our local hospital with some concerning symptoms. And I did identify that that patient has a, acute promyositic leukemia, a, a very aggressive uh, cancer that can progress very rapidly, but has highly curable. And, you know, I think that this patient, it's very important that we act very quickly and that this patient is, in, in this particular patient's case, I want this patient up to see Dr. Soboda manage in, in his hospital um, so that, you know, all the care, just as he outlined, is going to be delivered. So I call Dr. Soboda, we transfer the patient up there um, and we kind of go through that process. And, and when the patient is ready to get back home and, and have spaced out visits, uh, uh, I, I, we kind of pass the baton off back to the local care for the more frequent visits. Um, I can follow that patient weekly for lab uh, monitoring and I could see her, uh, him or her very frequently to check in. And, and then much of the, you know, longer term consolidation type of treatment can be delivered uh, close to home. And, uh, and then uh, meeting with Dr. Svoboda uh, intermittently um, along the way. And, and as issues come up, I may reach out to him to kind of triage uh, situations uh, as they may occur. Um, and so that's uh, one example. And on, on the other uh, end of the spectrum, I may have someone with a, a, a lower or more indolent type of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome um, but I, one patient in particular had had some complex comorbidities, and uh, and I really thought it would be uh, strong. I mean, most of these patients I am all, all discussing having them plugged in with academic centers, uh, but this one in particular I, I felt very strongly that he should, and and so I had him go up to see Dr. Svoboda. We came up with a treatment plan together, um, and oftentimes he's. Uh, at my office locally to get most of his treatments and care, uh, but checking in again with Dr. Svoboda every few months or so. Um, and uh, and so those are just kind of two examples of uh, different uh, um, 
um, you know, different journeys that, that patients may be experiencing, but scenarios where uh, collaborating really, I think, allows us to, to give a higher level of care for that patient uh, and meet their needs. Yeah. And something that, you know, we really harp on, you know, in our group, um, because I think it does make a huge difference on both sides is just the communication piece, as, as we spoke about earlier. And so, you know, every time we see a patient in our clinic, uh, we make it a point to, uh, you know, either call or send an email, um, really outlining what's been discussed, you know, um, go good or bad, um, you know, what our recommendations are, trying to be as specific as possible, um, and do this as, you know, really as quickly as possible. So let's say, you know, I'll see a patient on a Monday sometimes, um, and, you know, they might be starting therapy on a Tuesday um, in Dr. Kurian's office. And so, you know, I'll communicate the information so that when he walks in with this patient, he's not saying, oh, you know, I don't know what was communicated. I need to call Dr. Swoboda. I need to figure out this and that. You know, he knows exactly what the plan is. We've already communicated, gone back and forth, you know, and made sure that we're both on the same page. We both agree. So then when he walks in, you know, he is, you know, uh, talking about the plan that I already discussed. And we're moving right along uh, to next step. So that's really the best the best way to do it. Uh, the nice thing is, you know, we do, uh, you know, the the farther and farther we get along, the more, you know, um, integrated our electronic medical records start to become. And so I actually have access to Dr. Curian's electronic medical record. Um, you know, um, you know, we try to do a good job, but I think that's why we have to communicate um, with getting the records back uh, to know his end as quickly as possible um, so that they have, you know, the labs that we, we have done. So we're not repeating uh, testing. We're doing a lot of redundant testing. Um, we're able to, you know, see and say, oh, you got labs yesterday. Um, I don't really need to repeat that again today if there's no value add. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's the difference between having, you know, a, um, a good academic community partnership with good communication um, in a situation where you don't have that same bi-directional communication. And you, as a patient, you can normally see it pretty quickly when you go in and, and one end just, you know, feels like it's disconnected from the other end. Um, you know, uh, you, you start to feel like, you know, are my doctors really talking to each, each other? Um, and, and, and I think for best patient care, if that's not the situation, then, you know, I think you know, you should be looking for a situation where you do feel like, you know, both doctors are on the same team, are, you know, uh, paddling in the same direction for your care. You mentioned earlier the use of telehealth visits, things like that. There's a lot of, a lot of barriers to healthcare that a lot of patients experience. And it sounds like this collaboration can help to break some of those barriers. Um, you know, access, Dr. Curry mentioned was a big one. Are there any other areas that you can see this collaboration kind of helping or examples you have of this collaboration kind of helping to break those healthcare barriers? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think I think access is a big, big deal. You know, I think there's, you know, the patients that live um, in certain areas where there just isn't, you know, large academic practices that you have access to. So it's much easier, you know, if you live in the Tampa area you know, to go to multiple, you know, academic centers. And so, you know, what we see is that in the community practices in Tampa, they do send a lot of patients, you know, almost all their patients to academic centers, you know, and the farther you get away, the, you know, the harder that is. And one way, one way we try to bridge that access issue is, you know, whether it's the first visit or subsequent visit, if we can, um, and it makes sense in the patient's case, uh, we don't need additional testing. We feel like we have what we need. You know, we will try to offer telehealth, um, you know, we'll try to offer whatever we can to really just get a touch point um, in with a patient. And I think a lot of patients, once they get that um, communication with an academic provider, they start seeing the value there. Um, and, and then they are more likely to want to travel. Um, but, you know, despite that, you know, it's still rural care in the state of Florida, in the U.S. in general is, is tough. You know, there, there's practices that don't, you know, it's, or areas that it's 45 minutes or an hour just to get to the closest community practice that can do, you know, uh, labs for you, you know, and, uh, you know, it can be really challenging, especially with, you know, 
blood transfusions that we deal with a lot in um, malignant hematology, you know, getting access to blood easily, readily available, especially if you're needing it multiple times a week, it can be really, um, you know, logistically challenging. And so, you know, those are things that we've looked into, you know, we've talked to, you know, um, you know, mobile, you know, mobile transfusion units, mobile clinical trial units, um, you know, I think the telehealth uh, initiatives are really ramping up. Um, you know, we do have what's called TGH at home, uh, where we are delivering some inpatient uh, care, outpatient in the patient's home to try to get better access, um, and, you know, um, outside of the hospital to some of the things that we would otherwise do in the hospital. So, you know, we're, we're trying to do as much as we can, but, you know, you know again, uh, it, it comes back to having great partnerships uh, so that it, it's not just, you know, on one side, it's on both sides. Yes, I agree. I agree. I think that distance is the most um, obvious one uh, for the areas that I uh, serve uh, to the to distance to the academic center. Um, and I think that with that distance, you know, there certainly can be great costs with all the traveling. Transportation can be an issue. So I, I've had certain patients who, who just didn't have the resources to be frequently making trips. And I think in those situations, we can we can help quite a bit as well. Um, and then uh, insurance can sometimes be an issue as well. I, I mean, uh, so I found myself in situations where I, I, I knew a patient might need to be at an academic center for their particular issue um, and uh, their insurance, they're having some trouble getting uh, insurance approval at an academic center. We have a financial navigator that might assist. We have uh, certain counties I, I work in have uh, their assistance programs and where I might ask different centers. So doctors, Swoboda's uh, group in particular is, 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 uh, has been um, uh, very flexible with, with what, uh, you know, being able to accommodate most patients. And so that that hasn't been as big of, very big of an issue if I have a, um, you know, a patient with MDS AML that needs to see him. Um, and then um, other issues uh, uh, would just be, I think, um, the some sometimes folks need to be seen very frequently, well, a couple times a week sometimes, you know, for blood checks, uh, and so that can be very challenging um, when it's when you have to uh, travel quite a bit to to get that care. Um, so there, there there's a lot of circumstances I think where where the collaboration can be of a lot of value uh, from an access standpoint. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. And I think that's, you know, a big, a big area of need. And I think this is a great way to help address that area of need. I wanted to go ahead and start looking into some of the questions we've gotten. Um, I think some of them are really relevant to what we're talking about. Um, one of the questions says, how can the community centers communicate with the community PMDs? I feel like PMDs need to understand this person has multiple myeloma, so multiple myeloma better or whatever disease someone has. Uh, what, uh, PMD, what does PMD stand for? Um, I am guessing that's their primary medical. Gotcha. Their primary like doctor. the primary care physician. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, at least, um, I guess that can be variable. Um, I, I'll say at least for for our in our system, primary cares are linked to all of our notes uh, as well as the uh, academic partners. Um, so, and then you know, um, there's many primary care doctors that uh, will, if they're concerned about something they're seeing. Uh, pick up a phone and just give me a call if they are seeing something concerning and need to be seen right away. Um, uh, I, I'm i not sure, I guess, if the, yeah. the question. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can comment as well. Yeah, you know, like what we try to do um, is, you know, for even from an academic setting, you know, with primary docs, because, you know, the reality is that a lot of insurances will, you know, require your primary care doctor to send referrals for a lot of things, the testing that's done. And so, you know, like Dr. Curry and said, we, you know, our, um, you know, the way that our build out is um, in, you know, we actually are able to add uh, the primary care doctor to the care team. And so we, you know, we tend to send, you know, all our notes um, after we sign them to the, the primary care doctor 
um, each time so they can have, um, you know, an understanding of what's going on with their oncology care. And then, you know, I, I, I know Dr. Curian is good at this. You know, I, I try to do this as well. Um, you know, going out and meeting the doctor, the primary docs, um, providing my cell phone to, you know, primary care providers so that if people are, are looking to discuss things, um, they can pretty easily find us. And, you know, you, you can tell a good office, like if a primary care doctor calls in to our office and has to speak to me, myself, my PA, you know, we'll give them a call back, you know, with, within by the end of that day to make sure that they uh, completely understand what's going on with the patient's care. It's tough though, you know, um, oncology care is tough when you're, you know, an oncologist, you know, it, it, it is it very, um, you know, ch challenging, ever changing. Um, and so um, we try to, you know, ensure that our uh, community uh, docs and primary care doctors, you know, uh, completely are on the same page, but sometimes, especially with primary care providers, you know, some of the things that we're delivering, uh, some of the uh, therapies um, it is very foreign. And so it does take conversations and it does take patients to be kind of an advocate sometimes for themselves um, and, and understanding what therapies they're receiving and, and, um, and how to communicate that with the primary care doctor. Uh, but I think ultimately, um, you know, uh, the boat on both sides, you know, we try to reach out and communicate as much as we possibly can to make sure um, uh, that things go as smoothly as possible. And I think I think we as the oncologists also need to be mindful of what we're expecting and asking of our primary care physician colleagues. Um, so, you know, for instance, a patient with multiple myeloma or MDS that might be transfusion dependent, if folks are needing um, like weekly CBCs and very close monitoring uh, in case they need transfusion support or have severe neutropenia or if they're de dealing with infection issues as a result of their blood cancer, Hey, I really don't think that's a very fair thing for me to put on a primary care doctor to do because they've got, I mean, they've got a lot of hats that they have to wear already. So when you have a patient with a blood cancer that has very high needs, I, I mean, I really think that's that's my responsibility to take care of those issues um, and uh, address those issues. So um, I think also <clears throat> setting those expectations appropriately and making sure we're doing our part. And I think that's a perfect example of something that, you know, I as a community oncologist can fill that role in a, I would say in a much, uh, I, I would say in a more ideal way than, than ha having to rely on a primary care to try to keep up. Just like Dr. Swoboda was saying, oncology care is extremely complex and challenging for even oncologists to keep up with, uh, let alone asking our, uh, primary care docs to try to try to keep up with those needs for for those complex situations. So I think I think, um, you know, I think that's that's a really important role that the that a community oncologist can fill, uh, depending on the scenario that the patient is in, you know. Yeah. And, and just to touch on because I see uh, Terry uh, put one more comment there. You know, I think ultimately, you know, we, we try to have as many educational events as we possibly can. Um, where we do bring, you know, our speakers in, uh, whether it's through dinners, um, conferences. And so that's really a good way for primary care doctors to access some of the education. Um, uh, but it, you know, again, it, it relies a lot on the primary care doctor to really attend these things, um, to stay up, up to date. And, you know, they're not just dealing with oncology, multiple myeloma, acute leukemia, they're dealing with, you know, all the changes in cardiovascular disease, all the changes in pulmonary disease. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we have to, um, you know, set uh, appropriate expectations on what is things that should be in their wheelhouse and should they should be feel very comfortable managing and what things that, you know, even though it might be high blood pressure, but if it's related to one of the drugs that we're giving as an oncologist, maybe that's something that we should, you know, sh we should be managing to the um, the best of our ability or closely working with the primary care to do that. I see Vicki asked a question that kind of leads into another topic I was wanting to discuss. She says, many smaller community settings do not offer some of the new drugs like bispecifics that require uh, risk evaluation and mitigation programs, but many patients are unable, whether physically or financially, to travel to an academic center for this potentially life-saving treatment. 
can you offer some insights into coping with this disparity? This is this equity and healthcare barrier question again. I think I agree. This is a very challenging one. Um, I mean, it's in some ways a good problem that we're facing in that there's just been an explosion of new treatments and uh, uh, advances that have come out, but we've got to work to create the infrastructure to keep up with uh, all of those new treatments. So the bi-specifics, you know, we are working um, in our practice to figure out a way to accommodate those in the community. Um, and currently we're kind of piloting this with a couple, uh, with some, with uh, uh, and, uh, with some agents uh, where someone like Dr. Swoboda would would do the upfront treatment um, to make sure, which sometimes might require inpatient care um, and monitoring. And then when when there's uh, when the patient is transitioning to more of a maintenance type of phase, um, uh, transitioning that over to the community. But you know, with these newer agents, um, I think one is. Uh, there's there's a lot that goes into kind of creating the infrastructure and framework to make sure we're able to do that and able to do that safely and well. We don't want to compromise on on the care we're delivering by you know rushing to uh, to adapt these treatments before we're ready. But it is a serious concern. Certainly, um, it is something we're trying to actively meet for our patients. Um, and uh, and then for folks that just have uh, additional needs in order to make that, you know, over overcome that barrier, you know, trying to reach out to uh, community um, resources to fill in some of the gaps. So uh, some of uh, many organizations may have charity care. Um, and oftentimes uh, there are scenarios where I, I need to kind of pursue that to see if we can get some assistance that way. Um, uh, even things like uh, there's certain uh, uh, organizations that might be able to assist with transportation and, and other things, uh, lodging. Um, and so uh, try, um, so we have to sort of um, use all the tools that are at our disposal to try to meet those needs the best we can. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I completely agree with that. You know, I think, you know, there, whether it's by specifics, whether it's CAR T therapy, you know, great, you know, great therapies, but access is a huge issue. Um, you know, we, you know, at, at Tampa General take care of uh, patients, regardless of if they have insurance, have good insurance. Um, we really do, you know, um, take, you know, all, all, all patients um, in all walks of life. And so we definitely try to access as many programs as possible to help support the patients whether it's through, you know, travel grants through American, uh, you know, Cancer Society, you know, funding through Leukemia Lymphoma Society, um, you know, private, uh, you know, donations through the TGH Foundation and other foundation grants that we can then use to support uh, local lodging, um, you know, approvals for some of these drugs and patients that would otherwise not be able to get um, them. So I think that, you know, that, you know, it is a reliance a lot on, you know, community or organizations and, uh, you know, to really, you know, step up and, and try to offer this. You know, I think over time, just like other therapies that, you know, have been around, you know, over time, you know, they slowly get more access in the community. And I think, you know, with the bi-specific programs and newer bi-specifics that are easier, you know, CAR-T therapy, as we get, you know, better CAR-Ts that are less toxic, you know, they do tra transition, but agree, you know, we're missing out on a, um, a huge opportunity to do that now. Uh, and we, we definitely spend a lot of time uh, with our financial team trying to, you know, bridge that disparity as much as we possibly can, um, because we know it is uh, apparent and evident. And, um, you know, we're doing everything we can on our end to provide access for patients. We have um, another question said, I started with a community hematologist and a specialist and the community doc would not follow the specialist. So now I only see the specialist. Is this okay? Do you recommend a community doc as well? I think that's okay. I think I think it depends on, uh, I'd say the needs of the patient. So I'm not you know, sure what the particular situation is for, for this patient, but if they, you know, don't necessarily need to, if there aren't a lot of barriers in order to see your academic doctor and, and um, you're getting what you need 
um, when you need it. Um, you know, there may not be a, a need for a, an additional community oncologist for that particular patient, you know. So I have lots of patients that really only need to be seen a couple times a year. And so if you're seeing an academic physician for that issue and um, and uh, and your needs are met, you know, it might might be one extra doctor that you don't really need to be seeing if uh, so, but, but it really depends on the circumstance. Um, and then if there is, if it's more of um, your needs are not, your specific needs are not being met or you're not comfortable with the provider that you're seeing, um, ask your academic doctor if there is someone in the area that you live that that doctor works with. And they may, they, it's very possible, it's very likely that they probably no other, you know, have other patients in your region and have worked with other doctors in that particular area. And, and there might be someone that they are more comfortable with that might be a little more comfortable dealing with whatever the particular diagnosis might be that you're dealing with. And, and that'd be a nice strategy too, because more than likely it's someone who has a good line of communication with your academic physician. So I think I'd probably um, start by asking that your your academic doctor uh, if they if if he or she knows uh, someone in the area that they work with, um. yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with Dr. Curry, and I would say about twenty to thirty percent of my patients are true primary patients where they don't see a community provider. Uh, most of those patients, you know, live in the, uh, close or in the Tampa area, um, you know, and so um, you know they can easily get access to you know, what they need, um, you know, at, at PGH, um, you know, but ultimately, you know, there's a lot of situations where people are driving four hours for specialty services. And, you know, I am constantly, you know, trying to educate the patient that, you know, I, I we really want to do what's best for them, right? And, and so ultimately, in that situation, you know, a lot of times I'm advising them, you know, you probably don't need to be driving this long for routine labs or transfusions. Like, you know, we, we really should figure out someone that you feel comfortable with closer to your home uh, that I can work closely with to get, get some of these services done. Um, but yeah, in it, so again, coming back to, you know, everyone's uh, community to um, academic relationship is very different. But, you know, I would echo in saying that I, I think having both in most cases is, is probably the best, um, you know, way of doing it. But, uh, but there is certain situations where, you know, uh, one way or another it might, might not be feasible. And, um, you know, that's okay as well, as long as you feel very comfortable with the therapy that you're getting and, and the care plan um, and the doctor that's providing the care, I think you're in a good situation. I think those are great suggestions. We have another question that's similar, um, but kind of deals with this, you know, this idea of bringing it up. So they say any suggestions on how to open up this conversation with our primary doctor, specifically when we're the ones suggesting a second opinion? I, I don't, I think, I don't think any doctor should be offended by that suggestion. Right? I wouldn't let that stop you from having a conversation. You know, echoing some of the what I said a little earlier, I mean, dealing with a cancer diagnosis is about as serious of a situation that someone gets, you know, faces in their life as as it gets. And so uh I think any oncologist should understand that the patient in front of you, you know, needs to feel Con comfortable and confident that they're on the right track, even if that means getting us another set of eyes to look at it and sort of reiterate the same information. You know, um, I I don't know that I've really come across uh, you know oncologists that would feel offended by that. I think we all we all are dealing with a, a, you know we're all dealing with patients that are um, facing cancer diagnoses and, and their families. And, um, and I think that there's just, a, uh, you know, a level of understanding of what, what, you know, what, what we need to do to, to meet that patient's needs. And so I, I would find it surprising if they, if, if they took any offense to, to the idea of getting a second opinion. And, and also it, it doesn't even, it doesn't mean that you're going to 
break the relationship with that doctor. You know, I may, I may have a patient that goes to get a second opinion um, and then will come back to me for continuation of the, the treatment, but they have that a chance to kind of get a second opinion and, and uh, uh, ensure that, uh, hey, we, we've kind of thought of the, all the possibilities here and we're all on the same page as far as what the next best steps are gonna be. So um, I don't know, Dr. Swoboda, do you have any suggestions on how to have that conversation? Yeah, no, no. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I would echo a lot of the similar points. You know, again, I, you know, I'm an academic uh, provider and, you know, my patients, you know, there's times where I also recommend, you know, them to get a second opinion, you know, um, you know, to have a second set of eyes. So, well, you know, I'll refer patients to other academic centers um, to, you know, be evaluated for clinical trials. Think, you know, you know, think about things that, uh, you know, uh, in, in a complex situation, um, you know, uh, think about, uh, you know, other things, just, you know, have another person that can even say the same things in a different way, sometimes can be very valuable and very helpful for patients. And so, you know, I have one patient, for example, that is in a ve very gray area. Um, and when we're talking about, you know, a big decision, um, you know, for their care. And so there's no right or wrong answer. And so they are, you know, getting a couple of second opinions and figuring out what is the right answer for them. And, you know, I'm totally okay with that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, our role as a physician is to give patients information um, and, and, you know, and allow them to make the best decision that for themselves, ultimately, uh, you know, um, and, and so I, in, in my opinion, if, if someone is really resistant to having you get a second opinion, then I, I don't think that doctor necessarily has the values and the best interest uh, of the patient, um, you know, um, and you may, there might be a specific situation, um, but ultimately I would say in most cases, you know, uh, they, you know, all doctors should be comfortable with that, especially with cancer care, because uh, we, we are, should be very used to that. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I, I echo the sentiment that we just got in a, our last comment says, both doctors are great. We should be our best, most personal advocate. Any doctor has a problem or acts a certain way about a second opinion or having a specialist on your team, the patient should run and seek another uh, doctor. Personally, it feels selfish. So I think I think that's a great reminder um, that I think as patients, sometimes it's easy to feel worry that you're going to hurt someone's feelings or step on toes. And I think it's a great reminder that doctors with your best interest at in mind want you to feel comfortable and confident, especially like Dr. Corrine has echoed with the kind of intensity that comes with a cancer diagnosis. It's important that you feel completely comfortable and your doctors should understand that. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that we didn't really talk about in this discussion is, you know, having, uh, you know, in addition to having your doctor advocate for you, you know, I think having someone in your family um, also be there with you during a lot of these complex discussions and also advocating for you, um, definitely, you know, it has a lot of value because, you know, I give the same, you know, a very similar conversation over and over again to patients. Um, and as, as many times as I've talked, talking about, you know, a newly diagnosed acute leukemia, um, and educated, and I feel like I do, you know, as good of a job possible at communicating, it's just an overwhelming amount of information, you know, it's just, it's just, um, you know, it's just uh, a lot. And so having someone be there with you, that's able to sort of take it in as you're taking it in, advocate for you, I actually let my patients record the conversation if they want that, so they can listen back to it. Um, because ultimately, at the end of the day, like, the best care is going to be when the patient uh, or, or the patient and the family, you know, understands what they're dealing with and how to deal with it and are ready to, you know, attack it in the best way possible. I totally agree. More comments on saying thank you and putting the patient first. I think that's a huge, a huge thing that is, can sometimes be lacking in patient care. And so, um, I echo all of the feelings in our, in our community right now. Um, the comments are beautiful. Um, so with that, uh, we already addressed our patient, our questions. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for, um, all of your guys' incredible insight and your thoughts on this topic. Like I said, this is one that our community was interested in, and, um, I think this will be a great resource and, 
answered a lot of questions I think a lot of people had. Uh, I want to highlight something that can help. Uh, it's our Health Tree Care Hub. This platform allows you to electronically connect your health records and something we talked about, you know, being seen in multiple facilities. Um, this is something that Health Tree Care Hub can help with. It allows you to connect your records from multiple facilities, as many as you're seen in your community, academic, anywhere you've had your blood taken, anything like that. And it puts it all into one uh, profile. So you can see all of your blood work across your treatment experience, all of your different treatment options, things like that. And it's a really great way to help you as a patient, like we've talked about, be your best advocate to be able to see your whole patient experience, um, see your treatment options. And then once you have that account and you have those labs connected, it allows you to see some maybe treatments that might be potential options for you that you can bring up with your doctors the next time you see them um, and helps you to be able to have as educated a conversation as you can with your medical team. Uh, this is an electronic connection, so it's pretty easy, but if you were to have any issues with it at all, we have an amazing patient navigation team and a medical navigation team who can help you with it. It only takes a couple minutes, um, and doing this allows you to not only see your comprehensive overview of your history, but it also lets you participate in research uh, with your profile already including a lot of your genetic information, participating in surveys is really beneficial to people in the blood cancer community. So I wanted to highlight that program as we talked, it felt like it was relevant. And I, if you have any questions, anyone at Health Tree is happy to help you. I wanted to highlight a couple of our upcoming all blood cancer events. So September is Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, we've been posting some patient stories across different blood cancers on our social medias over this month. So if you haven't seen those, I would suggest going and watching them. They're all incredible stories. Um, and on September 30th, our Health Tree founder CEO, Jenny Alstrom, is going to be hosting a special webinar for all patients. This is going to be a really exciting event. It's all centered around innovation happening in the field of hematology. So we're bringing in top specialists from each of the major areas of hematology, multiple myeloma, leukemia, lymphoma, and MPNs. And they're going to highlight the exciting research happening in their field. So this is a really exciting event that I think everyone should join if you're available or at least register so we can send you the recording afterwards. And then on October 1st, we have a financial advisor who's on our Health Tree staff. Her name is Diana and she is wonderful, and she's going to be coming on to talk about upcoming changes to Medicare. So two exciting events in the rest of this month that will both be uh, really informational. Uh, so I hope to see people at those events. Again, I wanted to thank our sponsors who make events like this possible. Those are Pfizer, Regeneron, Johnson & Johnson, GSK, Cario Farm, Bristol-Myers Squibb, AbbVie, Sanofi, Adaptive, and Genentech. And then finally, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone on the call today uh, for helping us to build our communities, our patient communities. My email is on this slide, and if you've attended events for your specific diseases before, I'm sure you have the access to your disease education manager's emails as well, or you can email me and we're happy to get you to who you need. If you have questions, if you have suggestions for topics you'd like to see us cover, that's what we love to cover the most, so please send those. And I appreciate you all. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And I hope to see all of you at another Health Tree webinar soon.